Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's 12.30, it's time for SFU City Conversations. I'm Michael Alexander, the director of SFU City Conversations. We're presented by SFU Public Square, and we want to thank our sponsors, SFU Vancouver, SFU Public Square, the SFU City Program. This is our sixth year, but this is also the 30th year of SFU's Van SFU Vancouver's engagement with the city and with the region. So uh, welcome, there are going to be lots of events like this engaging you and uh, helping you participate. We want to acknowledge that this event is taking place on unceded traditional Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil uh, nations. We thank them for that. Um, this is not a lecture. For those of you who have not been to a city conversation before, this is not a lecture. We do not have speakers and we do not have an audience. Instead, we have presenters and participants and you are the participants. And that's what we want to encourage, which is your participation. The presenters will briefly frame the conversation, but most of the time is going to be for your questions, your opinions, and your observations. The point is to encourage conversation. If you brought your lunch, thank you so much. It is not rude to eat your lunch at City Conversations. This is a lunchtime event. If you are, if you are tweeting, it's at CityCom. And if you are new to City Conversations and want to be uh, uh, notified of the events that we have, we're doing one a month, uh, we'll, there will be a sign-up sheet going uh, around and please uh, sign up. Our conversation today, something that a lot of Vancouverites have heard about, dirty money number two. It's about hot cars and housing. Last year, David Eby, BC's Attorney General, directed former RCMP uh, uh, Administrator Peter German to investigate money laundering in the, in the province's casino industry. In his visit with SFU City Conversations last year, Dr. German detailed the scandal internationally known as the Vancouver Model. Now we're back with new reports on money laundering with exotic cars and the BC housing market. And as it turns out, housing across uh, uh, Canada. We're already seeing positive and negative results of these inquiries. BC is establishing a beneficial ownership registry and you'll learn what that mouthful is um, and the federal government has acknowledged the problem and provided some new funding to address it, or perhaps it's on the way. There's also opposition. Large BC developers say their salespeople shouldn't be regulated. And the new United Conservative Government of, of Alberta denied, without evidence, that its housing scandal is even greater than BC's. And while public exposure of criminality is good, the length of time required for BC's newly announced public inquiry might impede reforms. We're exceptionally pleased to welcome our presenters, Dr. Peter German, author of the report on exotic cars and other financial sectors, and SFU professor Maureen Maloney, the lead author of the report on money laundering and housing in BC and across Canada. Peter, I believe you're gonna go. While we're getting this set up, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to see uh, the crowd and uh, nice to see some old friends. Uh, emphasis on friends as opposed to the old. And, uh, and also uh, nice to see a lot of new faces. Um, two quick points. Uh, Michael, I love your hat and I'd like it at some point, but I'll, I'll hold off for now. That's okay. Uh, 
And the other um, is just to comment on Twitter. Um, I don't do social media well at all. I'm really not good at this. Uh, but I have two daughters who are very good at social media. And um, the original report, and I'll frame this for you in a minute, but the original report, Dirty Money, uh, was with respect to casinos. And uh, prior to it being released publicly, uh, it was sent to a number of affected, potentially affected parties, including casino operators. One of the casino operators came back with a two-page letter, we don't like this, we don't like that, and so forth. And then it was all sent to me to whether I wanted to incorporate the changes. And one of them was, we don't like the title. And the title, we think it's too subjective. And the title was Dirty Money in Our Casinos. <laughs> so, okay, that's yeah, subjective. So I said, I'm not a professor, uh, as Maureen. I said, well, what's the subjective part of that? So I said, I'll take out the hour. So I just turned it into Dirty Money. <laughs> and uh, so then it was released by the Attorney General. And my daughter, who's at UBC, um, no offense, I'm a SFU graduate, so I love SFU. Um, <laughs> My daughter, my daughter sent me a, um, a little message, you know, because they never know what dad's working on. He just works all the time. That's all they know. And so she sent me a message. She says, Dad, you're trending on Twitter. And I said, what do you mean, sweetie? She said, Dad, you're trending on Twitter. I said, well, it's, you know, like, how, why? And she said, well, your name and dirty money, it's on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when I realized, thank you, casino company. Uh, but by reducing it from dirty money in our casinos to dirty money, all of a sudden it fits nicely into what Twitter wants in terms of a bite. <laughs> and it flew around the globe like that, and it's still Twittering around. So anyway, okay, so that's my, uh, that's my intro. Um, so I've just got a few slides. I've got probably about eight or seven minutes left to frame this. So I'm just going to go through it very quickly. And then if some of these frames are of interest to you or some of these slides, we can talk about that in the question answer portion. Uh, that's money. And that's what we were seeing in our casinos. Uh, hard to believe in 20, uh, well, 18, 17, whatever it was. But that's also what we've been seeing in the luxury car market. Uh, YBC. So if, if I was given a little bit of time to talk, I would explain to you YBC. And YBC is attractive place to live. I was born just down the road. Uh, I love BC, lived in other places most of my life, actually. But this is a great place to live for a whole bunch of reasons. It's also why organized crime likes it. And uh, we are also Canadian. And so, you know, we don't throw the key away on people. And I did run the correction system out here and the federal correction system for a number of years. You know, people do get out of jail in most cases. So, but that also makes it attractive to organized crime. And then I talk about transnational organized crime and why it is different from what you may have read in your textbooks on criminology 20 or 30 years ago, if you are that old, because Transnational organized crime is all about this global world that we live in and how there are alliances now between organized crime groups, commodities shift. So we legalize marijuana. That just means they provide a higher grade of marijuana or they go to cocaine or they provide better service or whatever it is. But they will shift around, but they also do that internationally. So a cargo container may come into Vancouver port with 95% of legal uh, uh, cargo and 5% of illegal cargo tailgating. Um, we then talk about the Vancouver model very quickly. The Vancouver model is not something I came up with. It, it was Professor Langridge, John Langridge of Macquarie University in Australia is watching what was taking place in Vancouver, unbeknownst to us. And he is briefing people, including law enforcement in Australia, about what he termed the Vancouver model. And uh, I found this basically an open source research as I'm presenting findings to the Attorney General, I said, and you might want to know there's already a name for what's going on here. Uh -huh. And it's the Vancouver model. And of course, that floored all of us. I've spoken with Professor Language. We're actually doing a joint presentation in Brisbane in a couple of weeks. But uh, great guy, Asian crime expert. And what he was seeing is the underground banking system. And, and I can explain that later if you're interested, if you're not familiar with it. But basically, informal banking arrangements where no money changes hands. Well, money changes hands, but no money physically is transported, nor is it sent electronically. It's somebody in, uh, in, in our case, most often it was in China, uh, would go to their friendly a banker who would then debit their account for 100,000 US, let's say, and then that banker would contact somebody here in Vancouver and say, I've got 100,000 from client A, you can give client A $100,000 when he or she arrives in Vancouver. 
and client would arrive in Vancouver, be given $100,000 in $20 bills, which they would then take to the local casino and uh, gamble with. And that person may have no idea where that money came from, but in many cases, that money was the proceeds of drug trafficking here in, uh, in Canada, Alberta, BC. We also know the Mexican cartel was laundering money up here and so forth. Oh, organized crime, sorry. So I'm going through this real fast, yeah. Uh, this is just a little bit of a, this is an RCP diagram. It's in Dirty Money uh, the, in the, the book. Um, and it talks about all the different combinations and permutations to this underground banking. Now, if you want it, if you want to find this, all you have to do is, as my daughter would do, query my name, Peter German, and Dirty Money, and it'll pop right up from the Attorney General's <laughs> website. <laughs> And it always will probably. Uh, and if you want dirty money too, you just have to make sure you got part two as well. But they're both there and it's all public access, including that. So that's just a bit of a time frame. Uh, starts with the casino file, starts with the release of an MNP report, which government had, but had not released publicly. Then the new government comes in and they release it. And then there are, I do the two dirty money reports and Maureen uh, was commissioned to do the expert panel report on regulatory reform, et cetera, which she will talk about. Those are my two reports. Um, made various uh, casino recommendations on the first report, about 48 of them. They were all accepted by government. Um, I really don't think we've got a major problem in the casinos right now, but it will all depend on implementation and they're in the implementation stage. And one hopes that government implements all the recommendations, which will basically, now that the the horse is out of the barn, you know, at least close the barn door so the horse can't get back in. Um, and I can go through what some of them were, um, but uh, no time in, in eight or nine minutes here. The second report looked at luxury cars. A lot of people kind of pan that saying, you know, like luxury cars, really, is that a, an organized crime tool or is that something for money laundering? Well, uh, I had some really good people uh, working with me on this and they just went and talked to high-end car dealers who said, yeah. People are coming in with cash and we're in the middle of it. And we have suspicions about these people, but it's all legal. And the reason it's legal is because there is no reporting required by auto dealers in this country to our financial intelligence unit in Ottawa, to FinTrack. Casinos have to report, banks have to report, uh, all sorts of entities have to report. But then again, a whole lot of entities don't report either. And auto dealers is one of them. That's fine when cars are worth 10,000 bucks, but now they're 200, 300, 400,000 and, and uh, Vancouver, Greater Vancouver is per capita the luxury car capital of North America. And we have some of the largest dealerships for some of these luxury brands. And then we get into resellers. We also came upon a gray market where vehicles are purchased here, put in cargo containers, and we're talking thousands of them and sent over to China where they are worth a lot more money due to uh, differential pricing by manufacturers. And then it gets into where did the money come from, the use of straw buyers and a whole bunch of things. But again, it's in the report, but no time to talk about it. We then looked at real estate, which is a, real estate is the driver of the BC economy, as we know. So um, how do you nail this one down? So we really looked at international typologies of money laundering and real estate. We looked at red flags. We tried to uh, pull together those that applied to our, uh, to British Columbia, to Vancouver. And then we sort of drilled down uh, using data from our uh, land titles and BC assessment. And we also, um, you know, essentially looked at uh, court, court documents and, um, and public access, uh, journalistic accounts and so forth and tried to put it all together. In and of themselves, a red flag doesn't mean anything, uh, but you put a number of them together and you get suspicious. But really what we have coming in here is legal money. We've had money that's trying to avoid currency controls. And I should explain, and I didn't earlier, the reason why this charade with underground bankers takes place is because a lot of countries have what are referred to as currency control. So you can only bring out a certain amount of money legally. And China has a currency controls about 50,000 US per person per year. So to get money out, if you want to get a million dollars out, you have to do it some other way. You have to do it over time. You have to do it through Hong Kong. You have to do it through friends. You have to do it through employees or whatever. And that's why underground banking just provides a real easy way to move money without and avoiding all of these uh, currency controls. There are also currency controls with other countries. A lot of countries have currency controls. And then we've got our own underground economy, which we could talk about. And there's this thing called gatekeepers. Uh, those are people that really facilitate uh, transactions. 
Both Maureen and I are lawyers. Uh, it's not about the lawyers themselves, but in this country, the legal profession does not report uh, to FinTrack either, to our financial intelligence unit. Therefore, whatever money goes into a lawyer's trust account becomes invisible to police. And I use the reference of the GPS. You all know a GPS. So you're a police officer, you're following your GPS on a car surveillance. Well, it's the same with following a paper trail. You follow the GPS and then all of a sudden the satellite stops. That's what happens when the closing funds arrive at the lawyer's trust account, right? All of a sudden, no more uh, transparency. Those funds are going to go over to from the purchaser's lawyer to the seller's lawyer and out there somewhere. And you just hope that you can drive around and around and around until the satellite kicks in again and you can find the paper trail. That's the problem when you have these opaque situations. And those are some of the red flags that we use. Time is up. See, there you go. That was nine minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the red flags that we looked at, like I say, not indicative themselves, one, each one of money laundering, but put together, uh, they raise flags. And that problem says thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Maureen Maloney. No, it's not. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for the interest in uh, money laundering. Unfortunately, it is a really big issue in, in our province. And not to be competitive, but if you haven't seen our two reports, our cover is much prettier than Peter's. <laughs> ours is a little pink and purple. It's very pretty. Um, but I, I should, although this re, um, the presentation I'm giving today is my own presentation, so all errors and admissions are mine, I should say that, that I was the chair of an expert panel that also included Professor Bridget Unger, from the Netherlands, who's a UK, uh, I mean, an EU expert in money laundering, and uh, Dr. Sir Somerville from UBC Cyber School of Business. So all three of us put this report together in a collaborative manner. So. Uh, there were four main themes, and I'll pass over these because I'm going to talk about them. Um, the, the one issue, if I leave you with anything today, is I want you to realize how important it is that we get rid of the corrosive element of money laundering in our province. Everybody thinks and everybody cares about it because of our horrendous house prices, and certainly that's an issue. But there are lots of other issues why we should really care about money laundering. The first one is, the easier it is to money launder, and it is very easy to money launder in this province and this country, the more criminals we're seeing. Come on in. The more criminals we bring in, the more crime we're going to have. The more crime we have, the more fentanyl prices we're going to have. The more organized crimes we're going to have, the more deaths we're going to have. So it's not just about house prices, which are clearly important, but it, it is a very, very important issue that we need to uh, bear in mind. It also means that we might undermine the rule of law, we might have more corruption, and also it will distort BC and Canada's international reputation, which as Peter has already mentioned, if you look at the international press now, and certainly the international money press, we are becoming very well known as a really good place to money launder. So we need to stop that. Um, also, estimating the inestimable. Now, we've had some complaints about some of that, and I won't go through the details, but if there are economists or mathematicians in the audience, you can ask me about this. I am neither, I hasten to add, but I can tell you how we came with, uh, with our estimates. But I do believe that we probably have the best estimates but they are only estimates. We couldn't send out a survey to organized criminals saying, how much money do you loan to here? Could you tell us where you put the money? So we don't have definitive data. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I think we probably have some of the best estimates, but they are estimates. If anybody has better data, that's great. Let's have a conversation. Let's get better data with respect to it. We estimated for all of Canada that we think the entire amount of money that's laundered, and this is a conservative estimate, is about 47 billion in 2018. $47 billion. Now that's a lot of money. We estimated for BC that that amount was about 7.4 billion. For real estate, and it, these are less good statistics I might add, 
because we had to use different methodology for it. But for real estate, we estimated that probably 5.3 billion went into the real estate market. So that's illegal money that's just washed through our real estate market. Now, that we believe led to about a 5% increase in house prices in BC. Now, I hasten to add, that's house prices across BC. If criminals and money launderers decided that they only wanted to go into the condo market, they only wanted to go into high priced property, that would mean that those prices would go up much further than that. But we don't have the data to work that out. But just so you know, 5% is across BC. Uh, as I mentioned, we think this is a conservative estimate. A rule of thumb by the OECD and the IMF is that money laundering is between 2 and 5% of GDP. For Canada, that would be between 42.7 billion and 106 billion. So we, our estimates are clearly on the lower end of that. So I, I won't go into this because Peter addressed it a little bit, but why is real estate in particular so attractive to money launderers? Well, one, it's a large and diffuse market. It's easy to enter. You don't need any specific attributes or talents required. Real estate is normally a pretty secure investment, although it's softening here at the moment, we know. The certainty of legal ownership in BC and in Canada generally, you can generate profit from speculation, from rents or renos, can also be a prestigious investment. And also, if you're making drugs in your property or whatever, you might need the property actually to do your criminal enterprise. Um, red flag indicators, Peter's already mentioned those. Uh, one of the things that we really did appreciate that the recent uh, provincial government put into place that so we had asked during our, during the process of doing our process, we'd asked the BC finance minister to think about introducing it. They'd already put out a white paper for it. We suggested some more recommendations with respect to that. And so we now have what is called the Land Ownership Transparency Act. In BC and in Canada generally, we have no idea who owns our property. People have numbered companies. It can be numbered companies from Switzerland, from Panama, wherever it might be, we have no idea who owns it. So unless we have some transparency about who owns our property, how much of our property they own, it's very, very hard to start investigating whether or not it's legal proceeds that are buying that property or illegal proceeds. So this is a real uh, recommendation. We have 29 recommendations that focus on five areas that I won't go into. A lot of it is, is quite specific. But I think if those 25, uh, 29 recommendations are put into place, I think we'll make a start on making a difference with respect to money laundering. But it, it's not just a BC problem. And I've been all over the press in many, many different provinces of this country. And the first question I get always nearly is, well, isn't it just a BC problem, Maureen? And I say, no, it isn't. One of the things, that we only had a mandate for BC, by the way. So I should be careful the BC government didn't ask us to look at this. But we said if it's 47 billion, and it's only 7.4 billion, only 7.4 billion in BC, where's the rest of the money going? So we thought, well, maybe we should try and just like do a little bit of investigation. And we found out that in fact, it's in nearly every area of British, uh, of Canada. I won't go through all these, but in fact, now these estimates are not that good. And I won't go into the reasons why, but if people want to ask me, these are not that good estimates. So they're a bit shaky. They're good estimates about the fact that it's spread throughout Canada, but in terms of where you fall, within the range of this, they're not great estimates because, because of the model we used, it meant that the rates of crime in your GDP had particular saliency with respect to uh, these issues. But in fact, Alberta was the highest at 10.2 billion. In we were actually fourth in this estimate. Now this is not just for housing, this is for the entire money laundering. These aren't great estimates, but they are good estimates to show that it is a problem throughout Canada. So even if BC deals with it, it doesn't mean we're going to get rid of money laundering. It might mean that our money launderers, certainly the international flows that are coming, may go to other provinces. But we don't want it to go to other provinces. We want it out of our country as much as we can. We're always going to have money laundering as long as we have crime here, because we're always going to have domestic criminals who are going to need to launder their money. But we don't want to be inviting organized crime from across the world, which is happening now, because the UK and Europe and America have really stepped up, and it's we actually estimated that most of the money laundering comes not from China, which most people think, we believe there's a lot coming from that, but actually it's America. And part of the reason for that is that America has very stringent laws and you're much more likely to be caught out and you're much more likely to be prosecuted. And so if you're a money launderer and you can get your money into Canada, you're way better off. So anyway, I'll leave it there for now and look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Dr. Maloney. And now to your questions, your comments, your observations. Raise your hand, please give, tell us your name, and uh, we'll call you. Yes, ma'am. ask you if you're investigating pre-sale assignments they were um, under um, until the NDP made developers say who they were buying and selling to that was very much undercover for years and this, this is not <laughs> yeah I, I think it, it really goes to uh, we, we found a number of areas in the real estate market really the whole real estate market is opaque in this problem You've got great people that run uh, the land title uh, LTSA, Landsure, uh, as well as the BC Assessment Authority. But the data, for one thing, is horse and buggy data. It's, it's made for a different age. And we were running into all sorts of anomalies, such as 21 different spellings for Scotiabank. So how can you do work when you've got that? We came up with more countries than exist in the world uh, because of the spellings of the countries. Occupations, people can list whatever they want. We have uh, Domestic Diva as a, an owner of a house. We have uh, Wannabe Ski Bum. And we even had four launderers. Uh, and, and so you have to hope that they're in the dry cleaning business, right? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really addressing the question, but the, the issue is what you're talking about is something that was almost rampant and still is to a certain extent throughout the system. Um, it is it's a fairly opaque system, and it's very hard to do analysis on it. Um, so we looked in, in our report, uh, you know, more globally uh, at, at the red flags and so forth, rather than at various constituent elements. One area, though, that we did uh, spend time on was private mortgages. Uh, we emphasized that there's something like nine percent of mortgages are held are, are yeah, held by uh, private uh, mortgagees, and uh, the the problem there is um, that uh, they don't report to uh, FinTrack either. So there is no transparency and so a lot of you know private mortgage companies are very legitimate and everything else but anyone can really set up a private mortgage company and the issue there is not only where do you send the money you know who do you give the money to but where do you get your money from so if you're organized crime you could set up your own mortgage company and give out mortgages and there is no financial transparency of that uh, at all um, so the type of issue that you're raising is something that we were seeing throughout uh, the real estate um, world, really, here in British Columbia. Maureen might have something. Um, not, not really. We didn't go into the granular detail with respect to uh, uh, pre-sale assignments, but clearly it was being used for tax evasion, no doubt about that, and probably was being used for money laundering because the prices were going up and up every time as well. And one of the ways that you can money launder is like you buy something for a million and then you sell it for two million and the next month you sell it for three million. So clearly that was a, an issue, but we didn't actually get into the detail of it. I think the legislation that's been put into place will certainly assist that greatly, but uh, it, we need more data. So, but it's a, a very good issue. Thank you. Oh. Yes, um, can we get you a microphone, please, so people who are online can hear you? that specific point I mean one of the things with the, the flipping of the pre-sales before completion is that was non-taxable money that people would be, were making which was helping the prices go up and up and up and up like have they finally put in something that's going to say you flip it you sell it you're going to be taxed on the profit is that now in place or not I know they talked about it a year ago and I think yeah. Well, the Ministry of Finance has a 30-point plan the Minister of Finance brought in, uh, which, yeah. It is in place. Now. That was part of it, I believe. So the legislation has been implemented, I don't know whether it's been implemented or not. So, like, as you say, this is a national problem. This is the D.C. government that's actually done this. But one of the issues for decades has been it's, it is a national problem, so the federal government has to come on board as well. So where are we at that? Uh, the federal government, uh, to be fair, has been very slow in coming to the table, but they have, certainly in the last year, really come to the table because they've recognized, I think because of our international reputation, that they need to do something about it. So in the recent budget, they gave $10 million, which is a drop in the bucket, I admit, in terms of getting new resources, etc., to it. They are going to make some changes to the money laundering legisl legislation, which will make a big difference too, which putting in recklessness as opposed to just... Uh, 
mens rea in terms of uh, legal issues. So they are looking at it and certainly in discussions I've had with uh, top finance officials in the federal government, they're taking it very, very seriously. So I'm hoping that they will come to the table, but certainly my sense of other provinces other than Quebec, Quebec actually, because of the Charbonneau inquiry actually, has put some interesting uh, good tools into place that probably better than other provinces, which people mainly think Quebec is not that good, but it, in fact, it's good in this area, but the rest of the provinces just really say it's a BC problem, not our problem. So I, I've been a little bit more critical of uh, the federal government. There is divided. One of the problems we've got in this country is that uh, because of our federal system, it's not as easy as in the UK to implement reforms in this area. There's federal responsibility. Criminal code is federal, RCMP, federal, provincial and municipal in this province. Uh, FinTrack, the Financial Intelligence Unit, is, is federal. And then you've got various different provincial responsibilities. Also, if the feds don't do something, then, you know, the province has to say, okay, is there something we can do to fill the gap? Um, minister Blair, a uh, federal minister, has been designated by the Trudeau government, by Mr. Trudeau, to uh, concentrate on organized crime, money laundering, and borders with specific interest in British Columbia. And Bill Blair has been definitely engaged on this. But, you know, it is one of so many issues that they're dealing with federally. So, I mean, I'm waiting to see the results, quite frankly. And yes, the budget did provide, uh, I think it was about 70 some million for money laundering. So the issue I think for BC is how much are we going to see if Alberta and Ontario are denying a problem, presumably it should all come here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but the, and the other thing is a lot of it is structured in such a way that you just hope it leaves Ottawa. I mean, I've spent 10 years in Ottawa myself, a deputy commissioner of the RCMP and of correction. So, you know, I understand how the system works. Uh, and you, you, so we're just hopeful at this point that there's real political will there and it's not simply a, a budget line. Um, we know that at the provincial level, uh, the current government is certainly engaged on this topic. The Attorney General is the Minister of Finance. But again, it's not about individuals, it's about that political will and momentum that will carry us forward both at the provincial level and the federal level. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thanks. Um, so just uh, talking about um, all this, uh, you put a lot of emphasis on the criminals that exist outside, that are bringing money in. What about the criminals in Canada, the politicians, the managers, the uh, staff at alumni at a university that are accepting bags of cash? Like, where is their, what's their role in all this? And how do we uh, attack that? Okay, so in fact, um, I have not been pointing the finger outside, uh, uh, solely outside. I, in virtually every presentation, I talk about the fact that the drug money that I, that I spoke about earlier, that drug money that, for example, these folks coming over from China were receiving was the proceeds of drug trafficking. And that's generally speaking, drug trafficking here. I mean, this is a drug culture we, we live in here. And we're very accepting of it and there's very little enforcement of it. So you've got a lot of drug money, uh, whether it's cocaine sales, fentanyl, you name it, uh, that is, is being laundered. Uh, we've got over a hundred organized crime groups in British Columbia alone by RCP estimates. So uh, we, we can't point the finger anywhere. And in fact, as I believe I mentioned, uh, a lot of the individuals coming over from China in this Vancouver model are really dupes. They don't even know where the dirty money is coming from. Their money could be totally legitimate in China. It's just that they can't get it out because of currency controls. So, I, you know, uh, that's definitely the issue. Now, you talk about universities. Um, in Dirty Money Part 2, we're the ones that raised the issue about universities accepting cash. And that came in as a result of a tip line that we had going. And uh, an individual came forward and, and gave us a couple of transactions that were taking place. So you've got the universities, you've got the public colleges, and you've got private colleges. There's lots of private colleges here. But you've got the, the public system. And, and uh, although the universities appear to have moved away from cash some time ago, I don't know how many, but a number of the public colleges still do, and private ones do. And if you read The Hunt for El Chapo, which is a book about the capture of El Chapo, you will see that Vancouver is highlighted there, that El Chapo's lieutenant was allegedly living here and enrolled at a private college here. So the hmm. government has taken action on that already. They've gone, there was an announcement here a couple of weeks ago where they've gone to all colleges and said, we want to know what your cash policies are and what you're going to do about it. And I think you're going to see a, a lot of change in that regard. Okay. Uh, we had uh, this woman here, right? Yeah. 
And then so, over on this side, are there one and then the back? Yes, I want to get, yeah. I'd like to know how long has this been going on? I've been here for 21 years. There were no luxury cars. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? There were no luxury cars uh, before. So it looks like it's like accelerating maybe, but like, so how long has it been going on? Was there a change in the legislation th uh, that created a loophole that people could get in or or was it like was there always an oversight and then suddenly criminals realized they could use it I'd be interested in Maureen's insights on this one as well um, that's a that's a, a very good question with a complex response um, which I won't go into in great detail other than to say one money laundering is the back end of organized crime and we have had organized crime here for quite some time. Uh, but as the world has become global, uh, we have become so much more accessible. And things like 2010 Olympics, which were tremendous, opened Vancouver up to the world more so than, let's say, Expo 86 did. And now with everybody recognizing that Vancouver is such a great place to be and accessible and so forth, that's, it, it's also become very accessible to international organized crime. If I just talk about the casinos as an example, in our casinos in British Columbia, they started very small, charitable outfits. A lot of you would remember that. Loan sharks have been part of that environment forever, but they were almost like mom and pop shops. You run out of money, we're here to help you, right? And, and to the point that they would be in by the tables in the casinos, you know, and they're easily loaning the money. And then they were chased out of the way from the tables, and then they went into the washrooms, and then they were chased outside. But around 2010, 2011, people were noticing that there was an international element coming in and that things were changing and organized crime was getting involved. And that's when the real big stuff started to happen. So, you know, it's a bit of a mixed answer. We've always had it to a certain degree, but it definitely has stepped up with global shrinkage. The only thing I'd add to that is, one, we don't have good data as to how much there's been, but clearly the extent we have crimes and criminals in our own country, then clearly we're going to have money laundering happening here. No doubt about that. I think one of the things that has happened, and I don't know at what period, but certainly in the last decade, there is no doubt that more international illegal money is flowing into Canada. But I think one of the reasons for that is that the EU and the UK and the US are really clamping down on it. And you're much more likely to get found out and prosecuted in the US or the UK or Europe if you're involved in money laundering than you are in Canada. If I were a money launderer, I'd come to Canada. I'm not, honestly, honestly. Wow, wow. We had somebody here? Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I work as a real estate appraiser and I've really noticed the problem has been quite bad since about 2014. Oh, can you hear me now? That's Is that better? better? Thank you. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, and it became like so incredibly prolific. I look at probably 600 houses or properties a year. And uh, from the period, the early part of 2014 up until they brought the 15% tax in uh, three years ago, I would say probably three quarters of all the properties I was looking at, there was something really weird going on with what people were paying allegedly for, for properties. And I'm just wondering um, to what extent like uh, the financial system might be completely compromised or it, I mean the, the financial meltdown back in 2008 happened because a small number of mortgages in the states were no good and it, the whole thing came down like a house of cards and I'm wondering to what extent our financial system uh, might you know, be compromised or corrupted. probably in Maureen's area, but anyway, I'll just say by way of opener, I'm really glad to hear that from a real estate appraiser because that was really our our suspicion along the way was appraisers must see this. There are various, you know, the real estate industry is so large. It's not just about realtors. It's about all the different segments of, and appraisers are really important because they're actually in there looking at properties, assessing them and so forth. They also do not report to FinTrack. And, uh, and Presumably the reason is because they don't handle the money, but they certainly see suspicious transactions. And so just based on what you're saying alone, 
you know, I would say, wow, you know, uh, that sort of confirms what we were thinking. And we've actually said, you know, appraisers should also be reporting. Uh, that doesn't address your question, but it is by the by. Um, another little example of how our system is, is just not very, um, we're not consistent across. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Uh, the, the only uh, point that I would make is that the, funnily enough, because the financial system here withstood the 2008 financial crash much better than certainly uh, the U.S. did, that our real estate and our different investments here were much more secure than they were in the state. So I think, I don't, I haven't got data for this, so, but I'm assuming that money moved here because, believe it or not, crooks like their investments to be safe. <laughs> Especially in a place where we don't prosecute them. So. <laughs> okay, there's a gentleman here and then this gentleman over here. Hi, my name is Paul Kluckner, or Peter. Um, you've, I think you've talked about the role of privacy legislation and concerns as being a roadblock or maybe an excuse to not do more interagency work which would help to share information. Would you two like to comment on that, please? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Really good to see you here and uh, good question. So in Canada, you know, we hold our charter very close to us and we also hold our privacy very close to us. But our concept of privacy is quite different than U.S. privacy law, for example. And so it is very difficult to access a whole lot of uh, data and a whole lot of information. And an example, and I think probably where this comes out in the report, is our financial intelligence unit, FinTrack. Uh, great people, great systems. They're in Ottawa. They have literally hundreds, if not millions, of data pieces, uh, you know, of points of data, financial information. The whole idea is to deal with money laundering. The problem is law enforcement is not allowed inside FinTrack's offices. So you've got essentially a law enforcement support agency which doesn't have law enforcement inside because of concerns over privacy of financial data, the charter. And having worked in Ottawa in the years that it was set up, like I've lived this, and I speak to, I was in uh, talking to finance last week in Ottawa, I was talking to FinTrack people, like they get it too. We are an outlier among FIUs in the world in that ours is a non-law enforcement FIU. So the net result of that is that F the FIU, FinTrack, has to guess at what the police want by way of information, which they will then send in an anonymized form to the police who already have too much work already. And the police, when they're doing an active file, will try to guess, well, I wonder if FinTrack has anything on this, and we'll send a request to FinTrack. And most of the cases that are made out of FinTrack data come from those what are referred to as FERS, voluntary information requests sent by the police. Can you check your database? So this is, again, a typically Canadian problem that really falls to the feet of the federal government to resolve, and it deals, it's strictly because of privacy and charter that we have this problem. In the United States, FinCEN is the equivalent, and it's run by law enforcement. The IRS is its enforcement agency. In the United Kingdom, the FIU is within the National Crime Agency, which is a high-end police investigative unit. And, and just to add to that, too, we can't share data because of privacy concerns a lot, too. We can't share uh, tax data with who owns property data, whether they can afford the property, et cetera. And so I, I think the government is going to try and work out that with the various uh, privacy commissioners. But uh, uh, again, because of uh, Section uh, 7 and the Charter in particular, that's going to be quite difficult to do, I think. Gentleman here. Uh, my name is Neil Atchison. Uh, my question sound, may sound a bit silly, but can you provide a, a, a relatively clear and simple definition of what money laundering is and and whether that includes you refer to the criminality but there may be some non-criminal money laundering as well and uh, it'd be helpful just to clarify that sure that so that would be in that first slide that I slipped over you know really fast uh, if I was given more time you know uh, <laughs> so it's about them okay and it's all, if you want to, both Maureen's report and Dirty Money uh, describes money laundering. There's about a chapter on it. But essentially, it's, it's the financial side of organized crime. Virtually all crime in our criminal code is done for profit motives. Other than sexual offenses and so forth, public safety offenses, it tends to be about profit. And certainly organized crime is only in for the money. 
So the money side of it is the money laundering. And you have three stages that are internationally accepted. Placement, getting the money into the system. So that's what the casino is doing. You're able to get your $20 in and you bring it out with what they call browns, $100 bills or checks or whatever. Next is it's in the system. You're layering it. You're moving it around to uh, to uh, to uh, hide the paper trail. And that's what happens in real estate. The money is somehow got into the system, whether it's overseas or domestically, and then you start moving it around. And the final stage is integration, uh, which is uh, when you finally can get that money out. It's yours. No one can ever trace it or with great difficulty. And the reason it's called laundering is because it's no different than your, your machine washing machine. Spin, uh, uh, wash, spin, dry. Placement, layering, integration. I would just add to that the actual legal definition of money laundering is that there has to be a predicate crime. Okay. There has to be a crime that has been committed and then you have to show that the money from that crime has been put somewhere for money laundering purposes. So there has to be a crime with respect to that. But it could be tax evasion, but it can't be legitimate money. That, But often legitimate money in businesses are mixed with money laundered thing, again, because part of the layering process that Peter, Peter spoke to. The one issue I, I would like to say, I, I, I know it happens at casinos and, and maybe at some colleges where people have turned up with bags of money, but we met with like a tremendous amount of the different professions who work in, in the uh, real estate business in BC, and they all agreed that it was an issue here and we should do something about it, but nearly all of them said, very sophisticated people, but nobody's turned up to us with bags of money. Well, the reality <laughs> is, organized crime, like they're trying to put millions through the system they're not turning up with bags, hockey bags of money, or as somebody told me, Lululemon bags, which seemed a bit better here, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that used, that's the old view of crime, and that still may be the true of the street, the drug dealers, etc., turning up with bags of money. That's not really how it's happening at the moment. They're much more sophisticated. They're putting it through overseas banks. They're putting it through different laundered money companies and they're coming through. I mean, it's much more sophisticated. So it's all about those different layers. So you, you're still seeing the, the bags at that placement stage, but once it's in, that, that's when it trails around. This woman? Uh, Sorry. Take the mic, please. Hold it like this. I'm, I'm Virginia Richards. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Uh, speaking of money spinning around, um, I'm from New Zealand originally. And what was happening, and you may be familiar with this, but I haven't heard anybody discussing it, uh, that money was coming into New Zealand and pre-sale uh, deposits, and then the deal was being reneged on, but the pre-sale deposits came from overseas banks, but the, when it was the deal was reneged on, it would go into private banks, local banks. The, the uh, government of New Zealand stopped that because they, they knew that it was where it was all going, and I haven't heard anybody talking about that in Canada. Is that happening here or is somebody addressing that? Certainly, I don't have data with respect to that, but certainly some of the people who pr made presentations to us said that it was happening here. So. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Jacques, can we get, and then over here? And then over here, sorry. Hi, my name is uh, Jacques Courteau. Um I used to work with uh, with Peter, and at the time that they set up FinTwack, if you recall, Peter, the purpose of FinTwack was not to check money laundering, it was to detect terrorism-related money. And at the time, the way that they got the banks to report any money was to say, we're not going to use this for law enforcement, this is counter-terrorism. It looks that at this point in time, other countries have expanded the FIU process to include the criminal stuff, but we have not. Is there, to your knowledge, some kind of a reason why we have not progressed down this road when there is such a need? Yeah, good to see you here, Jacques. Um, well, I mean, uh, the F FinTrack, uh, there was a lot of pressure on Canada to create an FIU. We were one of the last of the you know large developed countries to do it. Uh, when we did it in 2000, it's my understanding it was for both at, initially, uh, Jacques, uh, both uh, for money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, and But certainly, I agree with you that uh, the financial industry had to be persuaded uh, to, to, to go along with this. And 
Uh, it was done in a number of ways. One, we'll make it as easy for you as possible through sophisticated downloads overnight of financial data, that sort of thing. We'll, you know, create that much excess cost. There's also a terrorism element. We're dealing with terrorism and it's hard to disagree when you're told there's terrorism, but certainly money laundering was part of it uh, right from day one. However, the privacy uh, implications, uh, in my view, have overshadowed everything. Okay. Hello, uh, my, name, my name is Liz Watts. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you, what are your top three issues you'd like to see addressed now? And I worry about change in government for, uh, and how do we keep the ball rolling if there is uh, a change in, in government, if you could keep the pressure up and not lose momentum with the fix? Um, first of all, to the, the latter point you made, uh, I think that's absolutely essential. I think one of the reasons that money laundering has taken on some momentum, both in the federal government and the provincial government, is because people have said, we're not going to take it anymore. And to the extent that we keep saying that, and I really do believe it is one of the most pressing issues of our time in Canada that we really have to keep the pressure on. And I, like you, worry if there's going to be change of governments because people have different priorities at different times. In terms of my top three, I think the first one would be, and this is more in, in uh, Peter's bailiwick than mine, uh, better prosecution and, and better laws. And, and that's somewhat happening, but I think we could do a lot better job of that than we're currently doing. I also think uh, uh, an American jurist called Brandy said, sunlight is the best of disinfectants, electric light, the most efficient policeman. And what that means is that if you make people be transparent and they think that you can find out about them and what they're doing, whether it's because of the land ownership registry, if we start, we need a company's registry so we know who owns companies. You can't just be a numbered company. We want to know who owns them. We need to have legislation that makes people worried that well, if I go to BC, they might find out that I'm buying all these properties or that I'm doing this and I don't have very much money and I don't have investments here. So maybe I'll go, well, maybe to Alberta because Alberta says they don't want to do anything, but I don't want them to go to Alberta either. Okay, I hasten to add. <laughs> but uh, I think transparency is really important. And thirdly, I actually think that each province should have its own financial investigation unit. We need people who are like, organized crime is very, is very adaptable. <laughs> They are very rich people. They are putting billions through this economy. So like, they are adaptable. If we do something, they're going to change. We need people who are watching. What are the flows? What should we be looking for? What should we be telling realtors and other people who have to report to FinTrack, et cetera? What should they be looking for? You know, we can't just stay stuck in the status quo. I mean, we've got to be adaptable too, it seems to me. So. And I can't think of my feet as fast as Maureen, so I'm not going to give you a three, but I'm just going to say that we've got a public inquiry going on right now, as they did in Quebec. And if the, the Charbonneau inquiry uh, created such momentum in the province of Quebec that after it was completed, Quebec established a 300-person anti-corruption unit to deal with just the construction industry and corruption within municipal politics, half of whom were enforcement, half of whom were auditors. And that momentum has continued through changing government and so forth. So one would hope that with the inquiry, it's going to probably take a couple of years, that it will create enough interest within the population. I think there's a whole lot of interest already uh, that it, the momentum uh, will continue and that we'll see some actual tangible results, if not before, at least after the inquiry is completed its work. Although just to add to that, I, well, a couple of interviews I did with um, uh, Quebec Radio, and they were saying, well, it's just a BC problem. And I said, well, no, it's not. It's everybody's problem. They said, well, they said that about the construction industry in Quebec when we had our thing. Did anybody do anything about the construction industry in their provinces? No, they didn't. So I, I thought it was an interesting parallel, too, about that we do seem to think that it's all in one area as opposed to maybe we should look what's happening in our own uh, backyard, too. So. Okay. Um, woman here, and then gentleman here. Hi there. This is a question for Professor Maloney. Um, I uh, wanted to go back to your estimates about BC's share of um, money laundering from the whole C Canadian total, which as you mentioned, it's inestimable, inestimable. But if you could clarify your methodology, my understanding from reading your report was that you calculated BC's share simply as a proportion of BC's share of overall GDP. So isn't it 
the case that this could be a, a figure that's kind of wildly off? Uh, not just from GDP, we, we did it on the same gravity model that we use for all of Canada, which is what the European countries are doing. But because it's a, a country model as opposed to an individual model, individual provinces, it meant that the data when we started looking at different provinces, including BC, was all the same because we, we had the same models. And it meant that the two biggest issues were what was the rate of crime you had in that province and what was your GDP. So you're right in that sense. So it was much less sophisticated than the entire overall model for the rest of it. So that's absolutely correct. So thank you for reading the report, by the way. Yeah, congratulations also. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't yes, that boring. It's actually, let me say, I've read it. And it is remarkably, wonderfully accessible. It is not full of bureaucraties. It's it's readable. It's like reading a uh, a news story. So kudos to uh, to the authors who made sure that it was uh, uh, that it was accessible to the general public. Gentlemen here. Oh, Mr. sorry. I'm sorry. We I've shorted you uh, twice now. Can we get a, a mic over here, please? And then the gentleman in the back. And then we were. Rhys Kesselman, uh, you made references to pin track and limitations on the reporting requirements, I think with reference to car dealers, lawyers, maybe some other groups. What, uh, first, what are the barriers to extending the required reporting? And then related, what is needed to surmount the privacy issues to the utility and effectiveness? This of using FinTrack data. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, great questions. So uh, the United States has a real simple model. Uh, everything over ten thousand dollars. All industries have to report any cash uh, transaction over ten thousand uh, dollars. It's about across the board, including lawyers and car dealers and so forth. So they just don't have an issue with it. In Canada, we developed this hopscotch system right from the beginning. Um, there. Last year, there was a five-year review of our proceeds of crime legislation federally, all sorts of recommendations for change, including that one. Uh, whether you see that come in, I very much doubt that you will, because I think there'll be a lot of industry resistance from various different sectors saying we don't want to. But even the jewelers who do report have said, why us and not other dealers in luxury goods, You know, which is a legitimate. Um, so, so anyway, um, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic that it'll come in anytime soon, but we've certainly, uh, I shouldn't say lobbied for, but my report talks a lot about universal cash reporting. Um, and in terms of the privacy issues with FinTrack, um, well, I, I think I, I, I think it can go a lot further than it does. I, I think the federal government has, has been very uh, careful and um, you know, FinTrack has, has not been challenged on privacy issues to, that I'm aware of at this point. And, and I, you know, we do have a provision in our charter that allows for an override if necessary. I mean, this is critical stuff. Um, so I, I think if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, you know, Parliament can do a lot of things with legislation, but I don't know if that political will is there to change FinTrack at this point. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add to uh, what Peter said. We certainly need for a, a lot more people to be reporting. In fact, we suggested, for example, that developers uh, and their salespeople also have to report, which apparently has not gone down well. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other issue that came up, though, uh, quite clearly when we were looking at the data is that even the people who are meant to report are not reporting. <laughs> like, so we need to actually both get more people reporting, but we actually have to make sure that they do report particularly suspicious transactions. That there's just very little follow-up or very little auditing as to who has done that. And that's why we suggested that uh, every profession has as part of its mandate uh, a money laundering mandate so that they have to make sure that their, uh, the people in their profession are actually following up and actually doing what they're required to do under our legislation because they're clearly not at the moment. There's just no doubt about that. And with respect to lawyers, lawyers, in fact, uh, brought 
FinTrack to court because lawyers were put under FinTrack as reporting and the Supreme Court of, uh, of Canada said that they it interfered with solicitor client privilege so they did not have to report under FinTrack because it uh, offended the, the charter. So there was there's some room open for them to sort of have to um, uh, report, but the federal government has not stepped up and done anything about that. And we've suggested some ways to do it, but they still are a big black hole. Yeah, when in the Supreme Court of Canada did leave it open, it, it, they said there should be a workaround. Workaround should be possible, and essentially it's been in the federal government's hands for the last five years. And just to show you how the system just breaks down, uh, FinTrack lost its ability to penalize anybody, to fine entities um, a few years ago uh, because they're administrative monetary penalties were kicked out uh, by the federal court and it took 18 months before they rejigged the penalties. They now have their what they call amps again but for 18 month period it was not even possible for them to fine anybody for non-compliance. So you know these issues just go on. <laughs> okay sorry we have to stop it's 1 30 we always stop promptly uh uh, because people do need to go back uh, to work. We want to thank, start by thanking our presenters. They've done phenomenal work. These are two stunning reports. We've got a couple of delicious but tiny gifts for each of them. It's it's liquid gold, Vancouver honey from uh, hives for, uh, for humanity. Um, we want you to know that coming up, uh, July fourth to fourteenth, our friends at the Indian Summer Festival are putting on a phenomenal festival, and uh, take a look at IndianSummerFest.ca. They are producing world class. Uh, uh, performances uh, for us. Uh, put your names on the SFU City Conversations uh, sign-up list. Our next conversation on Thursday, July 18th, Vancouverism, the new book by Larry Beasley. We'll have Larry Beasley, uh, the former uh, co-director of Planning for Vancouver uh, at the event as well as his co-director, Ann McAfee. Uh, that's July 18th. It's going to, it won't be here. It will be down the street at uh, the Little Park. We go outdoors at the Little Park at uh, the foot of Hornby Street uh, at, West, uh, at West Hastings. So bring yourselves and your sun hats. Uh, don't forget to visit uh, our events at the Indian Summer Festival and Thank you for coming. This is our largest audience, and it was a great one. Thank you.